So I I can start by saying I have probably the unique and amazingly <laughs> good fortune to be able to introduce our next speaker. Good fortune because if she wasn't my mother, I would not be here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can only say how delighted I am because I I and also really just say a huge thank you because I've been asking her to come on to to this talk and I was really just teasing and she said yes and it for me it's amazing the sort of energy focus she has to come and talk to us um, uh, today it, it's just wonderful and I keep meeting executives who uh, say oh I'm too old for technology and um, Ma, you're, you're actually twice as old as the executives say for example I've been working with today and so it's really good that you experiment with new things and I think you're going to inspire all of us. Um, so all I'll say is thank you very much for coming. Thank you for taking the time with Leo to prepare and to everybody. Please ask her lots of questions. She's, she's led an amazing life. She's got lots and lots of stories. She's very, 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 very humble. So she won't say all the things which she should say. But apart from that, <laughs> over to you, everybody, Dr. Letitia Bing. My mother, thank you very much. Applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is amazing. Hello. Um, Eddie asked me to share with you through this amazing facility some of the challenges that I've faced through my checkered career as a lecturer at a college director of a research institute director of a united nations regional office and the president of the academy of sciences in my country this has spanned over 60 years um i don't think i'm going to try and bore you with any technical details but feel free to ask me questions as i would want to ask you questions too I have to say again, thank you for being here. But before I start talking, allow me to say that this is yet another unique experience for me. Meeting you through this amazing cube virtual reality. It's quite new to me. It's nice, it makes it nice to meet you. And I hope your friends and companies you know will also be as excited as I am and make use of this amazing, fantastic cube virtual reality facility. I'm going to tell you, give you uh, three accounts of three things which happened to me, three challenges that I had to face during my career. Yeah. And the first one, <laughs> was 65 years ago. When I went back home to Ghana, that at that time it was called Gold Coast, from the Birmingham University in England with a science degree in zoology. And I was fortunate enough to be offered a job at a new college of science and technology, which was then under construction, to teach zoology to pre-university science students. It turned out to be a very exciting challenge. This is what happened. After an interview and being accepted for the post, the principal of the college said to me, I'll show you to your laboratory. Of course, for teaching zoology, a laboratory and, and practical classes were obligatory. So we walked to a prefabricated building. Inside, there was a, the usual long laboratory benches and chairs. And he said to me, this is your laboratory. Wow. Then he opened the door and he said, and this is your prep room. <laughs> like the laboratory itself, the room was empty, except for a table with a rack which held three test tubes, a beaker, and a very dusty prior microscope with an obviously opaque lens. Then he said, you have to see what you can do with this until the ordered equipment arrives. I said, thank you. And then he continued, 
in two weeks, the students will arrive and you will have a number of them to take through the pre-university science course. Again, I said, thank you. What else could I say? I said, thank you. Needless to say, inside me, I was so excited at the opportunity to teach a subject that I really liked to other people. My head was full of all that I had myself only months previously finished learning, and I was ready to share the knowledge. But I had only two weeks to create a usable laboratory for practical classes. And practical classes were essential for any zoology course. So in my mind, I very quickly made an inventory of the basic requirements. During my course at that level, I had to dissect an earthworm, a cockroach, a dogfish, a frog, and a guinea pig. That implied dissecting dishes and dissecting boards and scalpels and faucets and what have you. And I had to find all these in two weeks. I told myself that I wasn't going to let unavailable equipment and essential items intimidate and discourage me. And I was so excited that I had even been given such a responsibility at a tender age of 27. I saw the creation of a laboratory as a great challenge. And buoyed by my youthful spirit and enthusiasm, I looked forward to facing it and doing so successfully. I went to the market with my fiance, later on my husband, who was already a lecturer at the college and always a pillar of support for me. So at the market, we purchased a number of ordinary kitchen pie dishes and a large amount of candles ordinary candles. Then we melted the candles and layered the pie dishes with the wax and lo and behold, they were transformed into dissecting dishes. Then we went to a timber market and bought local soft wood. I sent a person to make the boards, uh, dissecting boards like I needed. And and after a while, he came to me and lo, he had dissecting boards. Now, for the animals to be dissected, since the college was up country, I sent a person to go down to the coast to purchase and preserve dogfish in formalin and bring it up to the college. Another person was hired to supply frogs and other specimens as needed. My other big challenge was finding materials for teaching histology, which was an essential part of any course in zoology. Fortunately, when I was doing my course, I had prepared many, many slides as part of my histology lesson. And luckily, I was able to find many of them which were appropriate for teaching the class. So that took care of the slides for histology. Now, slides, you need a microscope. And there was no microscope except the one in the lab. And so not having a microscope should have been a major problem. But I was lucky to find and buy a student's micro microscope at a local shop, which was very adequate. And so I continued the preparation for the course with such excitement. And when finally the class assembled, I was also ready. My students were all male, some about my age, a few older than me. But I had a once in a lifetime exhilarating experience teaching my students although a few of them had never even looked down a microscope. I was greatly encouraged by their high spirit, their concentrated interest, and palpable enthusiasm to learn the subject. And in return, I put my soul into the assignment 
and the final examination brought results for the class which were greatly superb. So my first challenge and my first zoology class eventually produced many of Ghana's early pharmacists, agriculturists, and some medical doctors. And one of them even became a member of parliament with a, a, with a background of zoology. <laughs> it was most exciting introducing my science science to <clears throat> introducing to my science class what i had learned i wonder if anyone here has had a similar experience a similar challenge it would be good to hear about it and to know how it was handled but we'll talk some more about that later Thank you. Okay, thank you. So what, what we're going to do now, we, we're going to have a quick break. So if you could please click where your initials are, so you'll be guided to different groups. If we can sit, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask one person per group, you know. Uh, you had some comments in group A to F. Is there any question that came up? Well, my next major challenge that I, that I had was about a, a decade later after I left the college. And I brought it on myself. I, as I discovered later in life when I develop a genuine interest in a subject or an activity, I have no problem contributing to its application for the greater good. So it takes me to all challenges. And in this case, I just could not give up on a situation that I felt could become the cause of a national disaster. You see, for my PhD degree, I spent an amazing three years studying the larval stages of the black fly, or Simulidae. The purpose was to control the fly during its larval stages before it matures into an adult fly, which in parts of West Africa was biting and transmitting the Onkocerca parasite to people and making them blind. I was registered at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and I studied the black fly species in North Wales. The larvae breed in fast flowing sections of rivers and streams and in all weather I was out every weekend with my three children, then aged eight, six, and three in tow, sampling and taking, making notes on the species that I found. Now, I'm quite certain that 55 years ago when this happened, we must have been a puzzling sight for those who saw us, but it didn't really bother me at all. But there was a farmer who lived close to one of the rivers which I sampled regularly. One day, he mustered enough courage to come and watch me work. Then he said to me, Mrs. Obey, I was wondering like, where you come from? Aren't there any men to do this kind of work? <laughs> Instead of you dragging the wee ones here with you every weekend? <laughs> I explained, but he just refused to accept that I had to personally do the work in order to get my degree. And I'm quite certain that he just never forgave the men in whatever country I had come from. <laughs> anyway, three years of intensive studies within aquatic ecosystems introduced and totally endeared me to, at that time, the little known, fascinating and amazing world of the fresh waters, at least in my part of the world. I became aware of the well-organized systems in operation in freshwater bodies. I appreciated the potential vulnerability to both internal and external influences and understood the vital need 
for studying and understanding water bodies in order to manage and protect their viability. By the time I returned home, Ghana's huge hydroelectric project had been launched. A dam had been built across the Volta River and the river was changing into a huge lake which eventually covered about 4% of the country to become the first largest single man-made lake in world history. Against the background of my recent intense association and bonding with freshwater ecosystems, I was sharply conscious of the possible ecological disturbances and environmental upsets that could result from this pro the huge project. I became more worried when I realized that there didn't seem to be any visible preparation for studying or even monitoring the enormous ecological change. And I was further shocked that there seemed a blatant ignorance of the subject of freshwater research. Many people even believed that water resources required no studies or research since there was really nothing in the water to study. Some of my friends actually asked me, Leticia, seriously tell us, what apart from fish and maybe a few crabs and shrimps is there to study in lakes, rivers and streams? It was most disheartening because even though the Ghana Academy of Sciences, which was responsible for national research, had established full-time research institutes for cocoa, crops, soils, and other resources, the nation's inland water system was nowhere in anybody's purview. And I became alarmed and worried. And out of desperation, I sent a proposal to the Council of the Academy proposing an institute for freshwater research for the country. It would monitor, study, manage, and be vigilant over the country's inland water system and the forming Volta Lake, which constituted the country's entire share of world water. After much questioning and grueling interviews by committees of my peers, the idea was finally accepted and I was appointed director to undertake the assignment. So I was allocated a plot of land and after cutting the sod and designing a building plan, I started looking locally for equipment to start laboratory and field work because it would take time for ordered materials to come from abroad. I was searching so desperately hard that a merchant sufficiently concerned came to me to say, Dr. Beng, aren't there any men around to do this work for you? <laughs> <laughs> and so for the second time, I was reminded that a woman was not expected to do what I was doing. Anyway, it didn't bother me. But finding research staff was the major bottleneck since none of the universities at, the, at home at the time provided courses for freshwater research. So I recruited science graduates in other subjects and trained them on the job through the Institute's comprehensive field and laboratory programs and later sent them abroad for postgraduate studies in other countries. Now, the name that I chose for the new institute was the Institute of Aquatic Biology. Now, that was deliberate. I had been shocked that people did not think so much of, uh, of water bodies that I was determined that they would know that water bodies are living ecosystems. They have, they, 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 I wanted to emphasize the living nature of water bodies. However, 
the word aquatic was apparently outside the common knowledge and usage of a large section of the population. So the name of the institute soon became a household word. But I doubt very much whether people really appreciated the relevance of the institute to the country's inland water system. But that again, I did not want to bother me. Uh, so we, I started with the institute, and but before the institute received its first budget allocation from government, we had to improvise and borrow to keep work in progress. It was a big challenge, but it was also so much fun for all involved. We used, or oh, the institute used my personal car. <laughs> I had an elderly Opel Capitan car at the time. <laughs> field trips <laughs> and if for instance an electric plug was urgently needed somebody would reach to my house and remove one from a lamp <laughs> we used jam jars and coca-cola bottles and soft drink bottles and to store our samples and we made our own nets so, so you know made uh, our own sampling nets we built perspex bottles to hold our fish which we had in the in the museum this was all before ordered things began to arrive thereafter when the equipment did come with much enthusiasm the nuclear staff of the institute of aquatic biology monitored studied and cared for the country's forming volta lake as well as its extensive supplying inland water system we recorded comprehensive hydrobiological, hydrobiological data not previously corrected and diligently kept strict surveillance over water quality in the lake and in the, the inland system. We monitored disease associated invert, invertebrates like snails, the types of mosquitoes and that sort of thing, and kept a constant lookout for aquatic weeds which might invade the big lake. And we worked so hard for the first decade of the life of the Volta Lake under my watch as director of the Institute of Aquatic Biology. The lake stayed clean of weeds and very healthy. Thereafter, I accepted an appointment with the United Nations and had to leave. But building the Research Institute of Aquatic Biology was an exciting and worthy challenge. The opportunity to be involved in studying and monitoring the amazing ecological events of the world's first largest man-made lake in a tropical country was thrilling and fulfilling. It was a wonderful life experience for me. And for me, here is a gratifying end to the story. In the early 60s, in order to introduce and emphasize the importance of national fresh water research, I had requested and started the Institute of Aquatic Biology in two prefab laboratory buildings. 50 years later, in the very foundation of one of the two prefab laboratories that I had built for the Institute, there now stands a permanent building of an international Water Management Institute. I couldn't have you wished for a better and a greater endorsement for the challenge that I gave myself to promote freshwater research by building the Institute of Aquatic Biology. And I'm grateful for the opportunity, opportunity and the experience which even now still excites me. And it will be nice to hear of any similar experiences that you listening to me have also had and how it felt. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. 
Thank you very much. What, 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 we're <laughs> what we're going to do now is some question and answers before your final, yes. you know, yes. uh, bit. Okay. So uh, we, yes. we had some questions in the group chat. So yes. I, I'm going to start with one of those that were not answered yet. Sure. Someone said, yeah, sure. I too started life as a scientist. Have you found yes. your science skills have helped in later life? Oh, yes. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. You see, <clears throat> um, when I had the challenge to do the, the laboratory, well, I knew what to do. I knew how to show the kids how to do the dissections and all that. So in that sense, yes. But later on also, for the, the, the institute's experience, which I've just told you about, yes, definitely. It helped me to put my mind together to understand what needed to be done, what skills were necessary to do and achieve the purpose of the institute. Yes, definitely. And even in, 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 uh, in uh, normal life, in real private life, uh, as you know, if you're a scientist, you must have had experiences yourself where you couldn't have done whatever you were doing but you were able to do it because of your science background. Def definitely, yes, I have had experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was also one question here uh, from Anna. So how much your idea of what you needed to change as you learned and grew from 27 years young? <laughs> well, I, let, let me be honest. Let me be honest. I just did, I wasn't I didn't want to change anything. I wanted to accept challenges to do things. I mean, I wasn't the one who wanted to cause the change. I wanted to be the instrument for doing the change, if, if you understand me. Yeah, that's what happened. So the, the other experiences that I've had have all been because of the way I'd been trained, the way I've, I've thought, and the way that I saw things, and th 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 those three things helped me to do uh, uh, what I later, the, the, the challenges that I later had to, to meet and to be able to meet successfully. Okay, thank you. So would that be okay for you to do the, your final bits so we can you know, wrap properly oh. without rushing? Okay, well, yeah, that's a, that's a short one anyway. It's a short one, but also very important one. Uh, to my to my third challenge, well, that came. I, I I told you that I left the country after building the research institute, and I went to join the UN. I was uh, given an appointment with the UN. Okay, so my third challenge involved working with the entire continent of Africa. Of course, like other continents, Africa had its own environmental problems. But unlike some of them, managing the problems had to be done by over 50 separate sovereign countries, each of them with its own different cultural, religious, political, and other characters. So in 1980, the United Nations Environment Program appointed me the director of its regional office for Africa and made me its representative to Africa with the responsibility to promote awareness of environmental issues and to encourage sound management of the environment throughout the 50 plus odd countries of the African continent. Now, that was a daunting task. It wasn't like the institute which I brought on myself. It was a daunting task, but I, I was very ready. I was ready to accept it because by that time, I was so convinced of the importance of having a safe environment and dealing with environmental problems that I was ready to do anything. So, I found out, fortunately, 
that I had a positive advantage, which was that each country, each of the 50 odd countries, had a national environmental institution with a, an environment officer fully entrusted with the promotion of awareness of environmental issues, which was very useful. And through tentative discussions with the environment officers, I discovered that there was an enthusiasm and willingness to cooperate, to prepare a program of action for attention to the environmental problems of the Africa region. And so that was fine for me. But once again, I had a major dilemma. How does one work with over 50 individuals on a single project? Without Q. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what I did was I created seven sub regions from the 50 odd sovereign countries of the, of, of the African continent. And based on the nearness of countries, ease of contact, minimum traveling expenditure, shared environmental problems, and so on. And from the seven sub regions, I created a network of seven sub regional African environment groups, which are called SREGS, S R E D S. Of course, I included the islands as well. They formed a group as well. Then I asked each participant, each, each participant to produce, in order of, of importance, the environmental problems of his country. And from the listed country environmental problems, a priority list was made for the continent. With that information, and brought all the participants together from their countries. And doing that was fine because it involved less expense and less, uh, less time. It was really effective having that kind of network to work with. When the regional office made the SREGS work on the problems that had been listed, and the ideas which emerged from the workshops were realistic and down to earth and made the project entirely worthwhile. The network of the strikes proved effective in bonding and encouraging cooperation, which for 50 countries, it had always been difficult, but it bonded them. It encouraged cooperation towards the objective of the project, which was to prepare a program of action for the whole continent. And the, the network built an understanding and trust among the participants. The SREGs were also fully um, informed and understood that they needed to bond as much as possible with the people who were, after all, the principal stakeholders in the project in order to share whatever knowledge they had with them and to work with them. I think it was considered necessary at one point that the people should be directly consulted to get their opinions. You know, usually the people are not consulted when projects are being made for them. You know, we go there as international organizations and we select a section and we start doing our thing. We hardly talk to anybody who is going to be to be really involved, not the, not the government officials, the real people who would be involved. We, we hardly do that. But we were determined that the people were going to be involved in this thing right from the start. Because if we're going to make the environment safe, they are the people who have to treat it properly. So we had to find a way of getting to talk to the people and know their views. So I devised uh, a strategy which I called national consultation. 
the idea was that the strike member would go to his town, the, the town or village or whatever the problem was in his country. He would get the people who were actually involved or knew about the problem together. And he would tell them, listen, we want to improve this. We want to solve this problem. Please give us your ideas. What do you think about it? And then he wouldn't be involved in the discussion at all. He just sat down and listened. And in the end, the people would gather the information they had and their thoughts and their views and what they thought we should do and bring it to the select member. member. We did quite a few of these and we had a, a joint a, a sub-regional meeting, a strength meeting where the people came and reported to it. And I can tell you, I don't think anybody has said anything so effective and so interesting. Listening to the people for the first time, probably, and in their lives and getting the ideas, some of the ideas were so amazing. I doubt if any outside consultant or even even the strengths themselves and participants which came from the countries would even have thought of some of the ideas which came up. Anyway, following all this, the strengths prepared a down-to-earth practicable program of activities for the African environment. They defined effective and workable approaches with programs which affected populations in their countries, and but which they, the people in the country, could identify with and therefore be willing to implement. The strengths emphasize important issues, including environmental legislation and its enforcement, interministerial coordination, exchange of advisory services, but also a need, a need to support environmental management efforts with scientific research and technical studies on environmental issues. Therefore, therefore, the, the as a logical complementary activity, the regional office invited, there were 16 science councils, invited the science councils and they contributed to the program. The program of action finally completed consisted of simple down-to-earth self-help strategies which were within the means and competence of the people and the countries of the region. And for its implementation, the governments of Africa would be, would hold the, uh, the primary responsibility. It was an exciting activity as it was as fulfilling working with the working with the strikes. I feel privileged to have had the unique opportunity to work successfully with so many participants from virtually every country on my continent. It confirmed for me that with dedication, genuine interest and commitment, there is not much that cannot be achieved. And so looking back over the decades to all this, it has been really well worthwhile. We send the result of the, uh, the plan of action to the UNEP Governing Council and I retired at the age of 60 after that assignment. Thank you all very much. I appreciate this unique opportunity to have interacted with you. And please tell people about you so they can <laughs> Thank you. I think it's very important. It's an amazing, thank amazing facility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Eddie. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mama. Thanks, Mama. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh, thank I'm going you. to suggest that we have a few seconds round tables just to talk, and then we'll gather sure. the circle because I think okay. we'd be up to take. That would be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going out to bird's eye. <laughs> Okay. Enthusiasm that you still share out with uh, every word you were speaking. So that was uh, inspirational. <laughs> <laughs>
affecting an entire country. It was a, a really nice like sort of, uh, in the next three years. Years. The reasons why it would have been easier to oh. stop. Exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry I dragged everybody. It's just I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I know we are having several good <laughs> and interesting conversations. And okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. another round of applause for Dr. Leticia Bang and making this very pleasant afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.